Okay, so for those of you who don't know it, the Getter project is a suite of free software programs for electronic design automation. It has GSCAM, a schematic capture application. It has GNetList, which is a command line tool for creating netlists, which are lists of components and the connection between them. It has PCB for uh, PCB layout, GobWe for inspecting Gobble files before sending them to application, and recently somewhere in between those connecting this SON. This talk is about what SON is, why it is there, and if maybe you want to use it. So I got involved with Edda in 2009. Um, I was using GCM to add some, uh, to, to create some simple schematics. And every time I would add a component, I would double-click it and nothing would happen because you have to select it and then press OK, which I knew, but it still was counterintuitive to me. So I created a patch which would be allowed to double-click a component and uh, submitted it problem solved. But then I wondered if it would be a good idea to put the component sector to the side of the main window as a dock and if it would be a good idea to have a project browser where you could select files in the current working directory or property editor. And then I realized that with the way the code is organized right now, this would be not, not easy. And that's probably the way why it hasn't been implemented before. So because the, the uh, wish to have a common user interface, both PCB and GCM was uh, around for some while with Gatum, I decided to work on that. And four years later, I solved most of the user interface issues. I had the library, doc, a project browser, and some other features which were nice to have, um, which didn't exist in Gatum right now. But I still hadn't connected this to the main Gatum code. And that is because I wanted to have a good scripting foundation which would allow me to not replicate any code which is not user interface related. And this scripting foundation didn't exist yet in Gator. But in order to work on that, I would have to answer a few questions first. What is scripting? What purpose does it solve? And uh, what are the constraints under which scripting is working? So in a proprietary context, an application is this big blob of um, code and you can't inspect it, you can't change the way it works. But users with more experience usually want to automate the tasks uh, done in an application. They want to change the application's operations into more complex functionality. And also it may make sense to extend the user interface depending on the workflow for maybe a simulation or importing a schematic into PCB and obviously combine those two, um, create more complex functionality and extend the user interface with that. So what one does do is they embed a scripting interpreter into an application and export the functionality of the application as procedures to the scripting interpreter. And then they add hooks at various points, for example, application startup or uh, pressing a user interface button, uh, saving a file where user scripts are executed. So this is basically a way to regain some of the flexibility which is lost by not being able to uh, modify the application in the first place. Free software, users can modify the package, so there is no need to do scripting. But there are a few reasons why it may be a good idea to do so uh, anyway. Because the high-level application, uh, the, 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 the high-level logic of an application is usually more um, more uh, complicated and error prone to express in a low level language. So it may make sense both for the developers of the application and the users to have another language, high level language, to address this functionality. Also, um, if you ever worked with the developer console in Firefox, you probably know that it's really good for learning how the script works and for debugging. And it would be a, a nice thing to have that too in a, a IDA application. And finally, today most users will get the binaries from their distributions package management. So it is a very important thing that they are able to modify the application without having to rebuild it. 
So you may ask, why not write an application in a high level language in the first place? And actually, in most cases, that's a good idea. But there are a few problems with that. If the application does very data intensive work, like uh, bit shifting stuff, or uh, this is uh, much, more, much easier to press in, for example, C. And a solution for that would be to create an extension for the, uh, uh, for the high level language, which embeds uh, the, uh, which extends the language by this functional T, uh, which is done in, for example, C. And you could write the REST application still in a high level language and would not have any uh, performance problems because the, the important uh, data parts are written in C. Also, application startup time may be an issue. Depending on the machine, the script interpreter may take like a second to load up. And this is not always acceptable as a delay for a user interface to show up. So one approach to this would be to write the user interface in a, uh, for example, C or C++, and then embed a scripting interpreter, um, which executes the rest of the application, the high-level code, which is written in a high-level language. Another point, another point where uh, there's a big difference between um, what's useful for uh, proprietary and for free software is how do we deal with user-contributed code? With proprietary software, uh, vendors add this API and the users use it to add their scripts, but what they do with it is basically their own problem. It is not usual for user scripts to be uh, um, uh, to go back into the main application. For a, in a free software context, um, a model where user code is uh, uh, contributed back upstream is usually much more uh, is usually much better. For example, the Linux kernel is really aggressive about this and tries to get things into the repository. This has a few advantages. Um, users will see the code if it's in the repository. But even more important, the developers will see this code. When a developer changes something, and um, for example, the, the signature of a function can just grab the repository for lines from which this and can fix it right in the same commit. Scripting is often used as a way to move the responsibility for the contributed code from the users, uh, from the uh, application window to the users. But this doesn't make sense in a free software context. So by taking responsibility for the code, um, the, uh, the contributors are not left alone with old incompatible versions, and the users have the not broken code, um, even if the original contributor is not around anymore in the project. And finally, there is a, um, a part which is for, uh, for uh, um, which concerns the programming, um, because up to now, this looks like much more additional responsibility for the developers where they don't get anything back. They do, in fact, get something back. And this is really a good thing because they need to worry less about what they are breaking outside the repository. So in the, uh, if you have a plug-in model where others have their own code living on their own machines, you usually define an API to have still some flexibility because you would break everything if the add-ons would rely on the internals of the program and the internals changed. So if the code lives in a um, repository, this is not necessary. You can have the code use the internals of the application and can just change the code along with the internals if the, change, uh, if the necessity is there to change anything. So in order to create a good scripting foundation, um, it is necessary to, to uh, see what is um, what's a good idea to have for uh, scripting in a free software context as opposed to proprietary software, because the models we know from there may not be very useful in a free software context. The most obvious thing probably is um, functionality of the application should be available to use. And if you ever used uh, GIMP for, uh, for example, script foo, um, and have tried to run it from a command line, there is an option not to show the GUI, but it is loaded anyway. So when you run a GIMP script from the command line, it takes a very long time for GIMP to start up, which is not usually acceptable for command line tools. So the most 
the easiest approach to this would be to try to strictly separate between the GUI code, which is not loaded at all if there are any scripts executed, and functionality, which is a world of the scripts. This is, for example, how PC handles this. But if you do this very seriously, what you are left with is a slim application, which basically embeds a scripting interpreter and exports a lot of functionality, and then runs a script. But if you have this, you could also have just made the uh, part of the, uh, uh, the functionality of the application a library and invoke a scripting operator, which then runs the script using the library. So you could state this, uh, this idea to have the functionality of Git available as one of multiple libraries, which can then be used by other programs without having to spawn another approach process. Another thing which would be a really good idea to have is um, high-level code being able to operate on the same data, the same process as low-level code. Um, this has a number of advantages. For example, um, if you want to, to be able to switch which language to use uh, according to which is appropriate for a problem, then there should not be the need to serialize the data, feed it into an external program and uh, deserialize it back. Um, and also, it would be uh, uh, it would make the difference between an external script and a high-level functionality of, of the application much uh, much smaller, because it would basically both do the same thing. It would execute some high-level code, and in one case in the application, and in the other case it has been invoked in another way, but it's basically the same code. And also, it would make an interactive control possible. So in order for this to work, what we need to have is a clean uh, a point where the um, low-level code and the high-level code can both access the same data without having to worry for each other's um, uh, implementation details or private fields or whatever. So it is necessary to enforce a very strict object model where there are no um, uh, uh, fields private to some part of the application, so they can all um, in the same way access the data. And this, um, from this follows that it is not possible to have, for example, notifications when anything changes, because it would mean that any, every code, every part of the code would have to run these triggers, and if any part didn't run these triggers, then something would not be updated on the screen, or undone, or on undo and redo. So. For this to work, we, have, uh, we need to have a one oriented data model, where we have a number of revision objects instead of this one fi uh, file object. And um, if anything changes, the application just has a pointer on one revision object and can compare these revision objects and see what needs to be updated or what needs to be undone. Um, in order for this to be implemented in an efficient way, it would be necessary to encapsulate the storage uh, code into a part of the application. So, for example, the high-level code does not have to query every object and iterate over it and see uh, if anything, uh, if it has the right property it's looking for. But it can run high-level query like, um, please give me a handle for every object which has color blue and move all these objects with fit this handle to another layer or um, read all top-level floating attributes. So this is what I did. There are clips on storage, which is this uh, shared uh, storage part of the application. It defines the uh, revision type, which represents one version of the file. It, represents, uh, it, it implements object type, which represents the identity of an object, which is basically uh, what you uh, would have left if you um, 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 you just show me five minutes left or is this oh, okay <laughs> um, which is what would be stay selected if uh, you changed uh, uh, the revision by undoing or redoing and um, uh, what what would still be selected and it defines a selection type which is the same thing for a set of objects. In addition to this, it defines a set of data types which uh, contain the data for an object. And this looks, for example, like this. 
this is the structure for a net. And you might notice that some very common things are not in the state structure. Like, for example, uh, the bounding box of the object in a uh, wish on the screen, or if the object is connected, or what adds this net is connected to, or um, um, what, uh, net, uh, what attribute objects are attached to this net. And this is because the, the bounding box is something which can be recalculated. There would not be a wild situation where the bounding box is changed, but the object parameters are not changed. And uh, uh, the selection is something which is only useful in an interactive context. And it would make sense to have an additional pointer to, for example, a selection object. So if the script wants to change the selection in addition to the contents of the file, it can update the selection object. And it would be possible to change the selection, not change it on undo redo, uh, by keeping track of a selection object or ignoring it. Um, attribute texts are uh, um, uh, visual objects on their own in uh, GetAjeff, so it makes sense to have them as uh, individual objects and uh, keep some track of the structural data. Uh, so there are dedicated uh, libs on storage functions for uh, looking up all uh, attributes attached to one object, for example. Also, a question which is uh, important is what data should be inside a revision. For example, uh, symbols in uh, GetAjeff are usually um, added from a library, so the user does not expect them to be undone and redone when they undo and redo. And pix maps, there is no way to change a pix map from inside a GSCAM, so this is a strong indicator that they should not be part of the revision. Paths, on the other hand, are um, objects which uh, represent all the ge geometry which cannot be represented by simple line or uh, circle or arc objects, for example, the, the arrow on a transistor, and they are modified by moving handle inside GSCAM. So this is not a trivial question, it's what makes sense in this context. This is how um, uh, Torn is currently implemented in Getter. There is Lipson Storage, which I just talked about. Here is an example program, which I will skip for time reasons. There is Thorn Storage, which are Python uh, bindings for Lipson Storage. I decided for Python because it's a language which is relatively easy to learn, opposed to a scheme which is currently used in the Jeff. Here is an example for that. Um, Thorn.Getter, which is basically the parts of uh, libgado, which are interesting to use another application, um, ported to use the new functions. There is a new file form. There's a command line tool on, which uh, offers all the functionality you would expect not to be available on the command line. For example, uh, uh, converting file from one format to another or extracting uh, symbols from a schematic file. Genetlist, which has been ported and factored, so it's now um, uh, Python package and can be used uh, from any application. And there is support for uh, Guile, which is important because it allows uh, users to use the old uh, setup they have with uh, executed scheme configuration files and maybe custom scheme code executed in the netlist and it will still work. So if you're using GetAjeff, you can use on right now, for example, for writing scripts, which uh, manipulate schematics, writing a nest and best netlist backend. The most important um, restriction on this is um, uh, GSKIM does not use the new libraries yet. So you can't uh, manipulate the objects load into the editor. Um, but you could, in theory, use a Python interpreter to edit a schematic file, which I wouldn't see what you're doing. The most obvious next step would be to use the new libraries in GSKIM 2. Um, this is not trivial because uh, libgador is the shared part of uh, gskim and some other applications. And my approach so far has been to port the other applications to use the new libraries first. Um, I've done this for GNETLIST, which is probably the most complicated part, and started doing so for GTrip and lib, um, libgetter Cairo. But there are some problems, like for example, um, lib, uh, uh, GRIP uses a uh, uh, GDK spread widget, but it's not supported anymore. So it may make sense to duplicate the libgetter code and uh, have for some time uh, two versions around, one for the old tools to use, one 
so it can merge back into GSTIM, so GSTIM can be updated to the new libraries. With GCP, it would be or would obviously be uh, also a good idea. I um, post a data structure for um, for PCB on the mailing list, um, but didn't have time to pull things parts of PCB out into the library yet. And for our uh, projects, it may be interesting to use this uh, approach too, or maybe even the same library too. Um, and this makes possible to have a common user interface, um, which uh, is used for several uh, uh, projects and applications. Thank you for listening. Time for one quick question. Um, one quick one. Yes. Excuse me. The same for if I could do the same for Kaika, well, in theory, yes. In practice, I do definitely not have the time for that. But I could support you if you wanted to do that, Kaika. Okay. Thanks, Roland, again.